Welcome back, viewers. You're still here in Scope with me, Will Carver. Now, in the final segment of today's show, we're going to discuss a, a defense cooperation pact that's been signed between Jordan and the United States. Now, according to critics, um, more opposition activists and others within Jordan, um, the law was not followed, i.e., the Constitution was not followed, that Parliament was not consulted, that there wasn't a proper debate about this pact. Um, there are concerns that because American forces who are going to be within Jordan will be allowed to carry weapons, that this is uh, in part, of course, a violation of the sovereignty. There are, of course, other uh, details within the pact which are also worrying to these opposition activists and others as well. Um, what exactly is all this for at this time? Why wasn't the proper process followed? Or at the very least, why wasn't there more consultation on this issue? Or was there? Um, are these opposition activists and others all mistaken at this point in time uh, altogether? Um, there is a lot of talk about why the Americans would want a, such a pact as well. And there are, of course, geopolitical reasons for that, um, region-wise, et cetera, even looking further towards Asia, Russia, et cetera. Also, let's discuss all those issues a bit further. We're now joined by Dr. Hassan Al-Mu'mini, who is a professor of international relations and conflict management at the Prince Al Hussein bin Abdullah II School of International Studies at the University of Jordan. He's joining us today from Jordan. Joining us from the UAE is John Lillywhite, who is a private analyst. He was formerly based in the Jordanian capital, Amman. John and Hassan, thank you both for taking our time out to join us this Saturday. Uh, John, let me start with you. Uh, what do you make of the Defense Cooperation Pact itself, as well as the criticism it's come under? There's always been two countervailing trends within Jordanian history, if you go back far enough. And on the one hand, you've always had a long history of defense cooperation with Britain and America, um, really from the founding of the Jordanian state, if not before. Um, and then on the other hand, you've always had this relationship where certain aspects of, of the political class and perhaps even the security class within Jordan have pushed back against that. And I think this is just really the latest iteration of that trend. Um, and I would argue that in a way, what we're seeing isn't um, something that's entirely new. Um, Jordan has always had very strong defense cooperation with Britain and America. Um, I think over the past four years, particularly, um, Jordan's relationships with America haven't been as strong. And I think this is a way for the West to signal, and America in particular to signal, that Jordanian is a key ally, that the Jordanian relationship is very important. And that, as you, I think, referred to as well, this is a, a deal that is not just important for Jordan, which is in, in a tough world and you know has a lot of um, questions on its borders, but also for the United States, which is hoping to play more of a global role in the world and, and not really be as locked down into the Middle East. So I think going forwards, this could be good for Jordan and it could be good for America. Hmm. Uh, Hassan, what are your thoughts about um, domestically just within Jordan, the way that this was passed by royal decree? Should there have been more consultation uh, with parliament? Ah, uh, good evening to you, Akar, and to your guests. Well, you know, in this part of the world, the criticism is so common. I mean, particularly when it comes to uh, relations with the United States and the West. I mean, for many people, you know, defense agreements or other agreements would always be criticized simply because of this sort of, you know, preconceptualization of the relation between you know, Jordan and the United States and so on and so forth in that respect. Well, I think from my perspective, probably why there is somehow criticism to the agreement is the timing of the agreement. You know, uh, Jordan has been going through sort of economic hardship, um, you know, the coronavirus and the failure of the successive governments in terms of dealing the economy, in terms of dealing the pandemic. And of course, uh, a few weeks back, there, there was this sort of salt accident where um, uh, more than six people lost their life because of the shortage of the oxygen. So the public mood wasn't okay in, in that respect. And when the government officially published the the, uh, the, the, the treaty, it triggered this criticism from certain groups 
who are somehow usually would always criticize, you know, relation between Jordan and the United States. And this is because of this sort of collective memory of uh, Western interventionism, Arab-Israeli conflict. And Wakar, you need to understand one thing, you know, defense agreements always would, would be criticized. I mean, you know, yeah. in, in this part of the world and elsewhere, I mean, in that respect. And here, let me say something that, you know, I would say Jordan's strategic and military relations with the United States have preceded, you know, this, this treaty. And this treaty is only probably to regulate this sort of, 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 of agreement. And yeah. I think um, the issue of not sending the, the, the agreement uh, to the parliament, probably this is sort of a, um, uh, a problem. However, yeah. Even if even if it was sent to the parliament, it would still be criticized by those groups. I mean, mm. if you would take okay. so many agreements, yeah. No, and, and, so and, and I didn't to on that, and that you made some very pertinent points there. But uh, John, I'm wondering um, the argument on the part of some um, is that, listen, even if Parliament was meant to put obstacles in the path of such an agreement, that's actually the whole role of parliaments anyways, right? They're meant to debate. They're meant to make lives hard. That's what um, democracy is meant to be. I mean, uh, is this indicative then in some ways that um, uh, the democratic credentials then in Jordan are, are waning in some ways? I mean, I take your point. I think, you know, the point of the previous speaker about kind of domestic timing within Jordan and, and the perceptions of, um, you know, people in Amman as to, as to why this is happening now, fair enough. But I think in terms of democracy, you know, I think it's always been understood um, that the head of state within Jordan has a very large and wide discretion over what happens in defense matters. And that's, you know, very similar to some extent in my country, in the United Kingdom, where the queen is the head of state. It's very similar in the United States, where we have this idea of the imperial presidency since 9-11 and the massive discretion that the office of the presidency has over you know, foreign deployments and, and security generally. So I think there's a well-established precedent um, across democratic countries all over the world, really. The head of state does have significant um, leeway to make these kinds of decisions. At the same time, as you said, there should be a debate on these things. And I think the fact that Mem some members of the Jordanian Parliament, Parliament want to talk about this is possibly fair enough. But as I would say, specifically, if you look at the history of Jordan, going back to 1946 and before, um, there has always been a very, very strong presence of, of British and American troops um, on Jordanian land. They've been working together in deployments overseas for, for decades. And if you look at his history, I mean, in the 1970s, you had uh, King Hussein requesting um, American assistance in 1956, you had King Hussein, you know, rejecting Gladbasher and, and, and the British um, security role within Jordan. So it comes, it ebbs and flows. And I think if you do look at Jordan now internationally, there is a lot going on domestically. It, it is struggling. It's been through a very hard time um, with Syria on its doorstep, with Iraq on its doorstep. Um, under the Trump presidency, I think it was, was more isolated than it's used to being. And I think just the timing of this internationally and geopolitically um, means that, you know, domestically, it's not actually that new. But in terms of America signaling the Jordanian relationship is still important. Um, I think, you know, uh, looking at it from a wider lens, this is um, just really an extension of how things were really working before, formalizing them in a way perhaps mm -hmm. is a little bit unusual. Mm -hmm. But on the ground, not that much has possibly changed. Mm -hmm point there. Hassan, we're quickly running out of time, so I want to give you the final word. We have about a minute and a half left. Um, just overall, I mean, on the macro issue of then a British slash American relationship with Jordan overall, I mean, has that been an equal relationship? Because then there is, as you well know, I'm sure, Hassan, outside of Jordan especially, there's been criticism that Jordan is in some ways very subservient to the two. Um, is that a fair criticism?
Well, uh, Wakar, the issue of you know, equality is somehow elusive in this respect. I mean, if you would speak of Jordan as um, a small rational state situated in, in a harsh environment, and if you would apply, you know, small state geopolitical rationale in Jordan, Jordan has always, you know, did its best to forge strategic relations with regional partners and international partners. The strategic cooperation between Jordan, United States, and UK has always provided Jordan with, I would say, or helped Jordan to secure its security and stability in that respect, and eventually provide Jordan with the ability also to maintain its sovereignty. So here, the issue of equality, I mean, I mean, I mean one would, would, would question it, but if, if, you, if you would look at that, you know, the whole issue from a holistic approach, such partnership has been paying off for Jordan in terms of military assistance, in terms of economic assistance, and so on and so forth in that respect. And moreover, Waqar, I mean, when, when would you speak of those agreements in the age of globalization and interdependence? I mean, you would question this elusive term of equality and, mm. and sovereignty and so on and so forth in, the, in, the, in that respect. At the yeah. end of the day, what matters for Jordan is its national interest, particularly in terms of security, and of course, stability, you know, and to navigate safely through such rough seas okay. in the Middle East and elsewhere. All right, Hassan, I do apologize for cutting you off, but we sincerely appreciate both of you taking your time out this Saturday to share uh, your expertise with us. That was Hassan speaking to us from Jordan, and John was speaking to us from the United Arab Emirates, both of them sharing um, their insight about this Jordan and U.S. defense cooperation pact that has been um, signed through and approved through royal decree in the country. Um, the criticism on the other side is that it didn't go through a proper democratic process as understood um, through the Jordanian constitution institution and system of governance that should have been debated. Um, but then, you know, were, were the, was the other side essentially just looking for something to, to create obstacles for the sake of creating obstacles? Because as John said, it's not like this sort of defense cooperation pact is a new thing. I mean, the reality on the ground is that uh, the British and the Americans have been there for quite a while anyhow. So it's not like this changes a lot. It just sort of formalizes it a bit more. Uh, and as Hassan there was arguing, this is all, at least in Jordan's eyes, for its own national security and national interests. Again, an argument I'm sure that the other side would possibly debate as well. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.